Hello, welcome back to another installment of Red and Red this month. So the month that I'm doing is October because guess what? That's the month that just passed. Wow, we're good at this. We know how the calendar works. I tried to record this video a few days ago. It just didn't work out. I was just going on and on. I recorded like 50 minutes of footage and I had gone to the fourth book. I have to remember to like keep myself at bay sometimes because again, I read 20 books this month and if I spent 10 minutes talking about all of those books, um, we'd be here for a while and I don't want that, you don't want that, so we're not gonna fucking do that. What I am going to do is keep each synopsis to a five minute minimum and if you have read any of these books, you can definitely reach out to me on Goodreads or whatever have you. All I have is a social media is Goodreads at this point, honestly. So you can reach out to me on Goodreads, message me there, or comment below and talk about any books that you see here that you want to talk any more about. My last me filming, I was just going on about how gay I am for Otessa Moshveg and how good Jinji Ito's artwork is. First book I read was this lovely piece of ass. Why did I say it like that? Ass. Why did I call it ass? <laughs> I thought even I. <laughs> Holy fuck. But my god, Otessa. My god, Otessa. You've done it again. You always keep doing it. How did you do this? This book will for sure stick in your mind after you have read it. Because that is what Otessa Moshbeg is good at. She is good at that. The reason why it feels like a lifetime since I've read this is because I've been thinking about it for what seems like a lifetime. I always give Otesha Moshvik four stars, but then when I think about her afterwards, I'm like, wow, she's so amazing. Wow. Wow, what a woman. Okay. I'm in love with Otesha Moshvik. Can you fucking tell? I remember the first time I saw a fucking picture of her and I was like, oh, that beauty is making this art. Oh, it all makes sense now. Fuck. What more can I say except for she's done it again? Otesha, if you see this, my number is... How long was this in my fucking shirt for? First of all, Gigi Ito's fucking artwork. Hello, can we talk about it? I talk too much. It's, this has gone on for 37 minutes. None of which was anything that I even intended to talk about. So let's do that. Let's intend to talk about the books that I read in October. Okay, here we are, let's go. Speaking of Otesha Moshbag, the first book that I read was Death in Her Hands. Hi, I read her. This is the fourth Otesha Moshbag book that I've read. I read all of her books except for McGlue. Sad times, I'm gonna read McGlue and then I'm gonna be done. Then what, like wait another two years? Uh, I don't know if I wanna do that. Death in Her Hands is about a old lady who finds this note one day while she's with her dogs on a walk and this note says her name was Magda, nobody will ever know who killed her, it wasn't me, here's her dead body. And so this note this lady sees and she's like oh what the fuck, but then there's no body there's no Magda, so what the fuck is this, right? So the lady starts imagining, who is Magda? Who is her killer? Who left this note? Who buried her? Why did I find this note? All of this stuff. This lady has a wild imagination that is mentioned a lot in this book, like when she talks about her late husband he's like he's always talking about how oh you're always like up in the clouds whatever you're always in your own little world you're always imagining different things that actually are happening and all that stuff so there from right there we can see we have an unreliable narrator what the fuck is this woman even actually thinking we never really know throughout the entire story it is really interesting otessa moshbag is known to do those um unlikable characters unreliable narrators as well as uh having plotless books for the most part this was probably the most plot full book that she's had i think um but then eileen and my year of rest and relaxation is literally just a person being a person and just existing and that's a lot of otessa moshbag stuff i absolutely love it i gave this book a four star by the way didn't say that I always gave Otessa Moshbag four stars for some, whatever reason. Like, I did say she was my favorite author, which is still remains true. But, um, in a different way. It's so interesting. Okay, first of all, she's hot as fuck. Can you imagine, like, 
<laughs> the reason why somebody's a favorite author is because you think that they're like that attractive no but there's also the fact that she writes so amazingly the characters wow i give them four stars because i don't know i guess this is my instant reaction right after but if you have ever read a notessa mosfeck book i know you guys can relate you're like what the fuck why am i still thinking about that book why did that book randomly come into my mind yeah she'll have that impact on you for sure and that's why i'm like she's just so am i'm like i've never had anybody be able to like do that for me. Thank you, Otessa. Thank you. Death was a big theme in this book, hence the fucking name. This lady finds herself surrounded by death, like her uh, husband died and she's 78. I don't know how old she is. Why did that number come to my mind? I don't know. She's in her 70s and, um, you know, she's kind of faced with what it means to live and die every single fucking day because she's on like she could die any day you know and then there's also magda who is now dead who she doesn't know but that's another death in her life and then there's other things in th throughout the book that i'm not going to say because that could be spoiling i enjoy that theme that makes me sound really dark huh i mean i enjoy reading about other people's opinions on death can you blame me? I don't know. We'll get more into why I am like that later down the road. I don't know why I held this book up. It's just like such a, like it's now that it's in my hand, I feel like I need to do this. Okay. Otesha Moshfeg really just comes out with banger after banger. Your fave could never. The next book I read here in this October month is The Billionaire's Wake Up Call Girl by Anika Martin. I'm really good at remembering things. Hi. I gave this book a two star. This is a romance book about a CEO who has, he always has this wake up call service. Wake him up at 4 a.m. Uh, th that's just the thing that he's always done. Instead of having an alarm, like a normal person in 2000, this book came out in 2018. So I'm just gonna say in 2018. Uh, he wants a wake up call service. Like, like people to call him and wake him up. I shouldn't be dashing in my opinions while I'm trying to tell you the synopsis, but I already said I gave it a two star. You can probably imagine what I think about this fucking book. But this motherfucker, I don't remember his name by the way, that's how much I care about this book, but this motherfucker, um, we'll just call him the CEO, is a hard ass. He's a hard ass and so people don't want to work with him anymore. Wake up call services, the only ones that exist still around him, don't want to work with him. They want nothing to do with him. And um, so he's fucked that up, huh? But then he tells his assistant to find him a new service and then his assistant's like, oh fuck, I can't do that. So his assistant asks her assistant or like her, what was she there for? She just was there for the bonus. But this girl's name is Lizzie. So she is given this project. Find the CEO a wake up call service. So she comes up with a plan to like wake him up. Like she doesn't know what she's really doing, but while she is in the middle of this plan, like he's on the other end or she like has dialed his number. She's ranting to her friend and being like, you know what I should say? I should say, get the fuck up you piece of shit. Are you ready to make people's lives miserable? You cocksucker. That I just made up. Like, I mean, I don't know, but that's just like an example. And it turns out that he's on the other end hearing all of this. And he thinks that this is a wake up call service waking him up for the morning uh, at 4 a.m. Time to start your day, sir. And, you know, obviously Lizzie did this by accident. And the guy on the, and the CEO, he's like, is this real? This ain't no real sir. wake up call service. There's no way. There's no way this is a real wake up call service. LOL. And he keeps saying that over and over again. He's like, it's so unconventional. This is not a real wake up call service. Who the fuck are you? But then she like keeps saying she's a wake up call service. She's all like, that's just our way of doing things. We just wake up clients like that. So he continues to get services from this company that she made up and this girl, Lizzie. And eventually, not even eventually, it's literally like two calls in, all of a sudden, the motherfuckers are having phone sex. Uh, here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with phone sex. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is, ahem, you're going to tell me that this man, who by the way, nobody likes, he doesn't have a girlfriend, like he's known to like, not have a girlfriend, he's known to be grumpy and like, irritable and like people don't want to fucking work with him they're scared of him all of that stuff so this guy who is that is talking on the phone 
to this girl who's apparently doing her job like he thinks she's doing her job like if he is convinced that she is a phone call service that's just a little unconventional she's still doing her job right and then he's all of a sudden like uh-oh pee pee hard and like wants to fuck her if i was on the phone to somebody who was just like oh i just really like your voice so i'm gonna like i would be upset hello that'd be weird right it's weird too because like he just thinks she's doing her job right right and then it's also weird because she knows it's her boss he doesn't know that but she does and that's like adds another layer i only read this book because i was going to challenge myself to read five romance books um because that's a genre that i tend to stay away from or just don't understand even though i do desperately want to understand the entire hype uh that is romance books but this book did not help me figure that out along with all the other romance books that I have read in the past. But I read this book and then I was like, you know, I don't want to read romance that bad. I don't want to get the hype that bad. I hated reading it. I read it one day though, two? I don't know. But afterward, I was like, every single time I opened it, I was like, why am I doing this again? And I didn't want to keep doing that for four other books. So I just scrapped that idea. So the next book that I read was a five star called Magma by Thora. I have no clue how to pronounce her last name. It's like Icelandic or something. This book is about a 20 year old college student named Lilha. I really don't know how to pronounce her name. L-I-L-J-A. I'm just gonna pronounce it Lilha. Okay, cool. Finds herself in a non relationship with this man who basically just uses her. He doesn't really want her. He doesn't really care for her, but she will do anything for him. And she sacrifices her safety and her um, comfort for his happiness all the fucking time. This guy is so obsessed with his ex. He texts this girl named Magma all the time through Facebook. He would rather have anything else that he sees in like all the porn that he watches than this girl that he does have in his bed right now. And Lilha knows that and it depresses her. This book was only 116 pages, or at least it was on like the Scribd app or whatever the fuck. And I flew through it, it was so fast. Some of these things were so realistic. The way that this author wrote about how Lilha's standards kept slipping slowly um, I think that was done really well because one second she's like, oh, I would never ever do that. And then two, three, four pages later, you see her doing that thing. And then him being like, you like it now, don't you? Like all this stuff. I don't want to say what things are because that those would be spoilers. Like I don't want to say the events of, of which happens. Again, it's a very short book. Hi, I took a small second of a break, a, a bit of a break there for a second what i'm sorry this is going to be a little bit of a messy part because i don't know what i just said i don't know what i have been saying i don't know what i'm going to say so here we are um i'm just gonna go on to the next book wow no thank you by samantha irby this is a collection of essays it was really entertaining it was really funny some of the things actually made me laugh out loud i'm excited to go on and read more of her work i found while well, i was reading this book actually her other book uh we are never meeting in real life at goodwill for 99 cents and i was like well that's one heck of a steal don't mind if i do so i did and it's in my bookcase right now as we speak so i'm really excited to read more of samantha irby's work uh i gave this a four star this is kind of getting me like into nonfiction a little um i've been getting more and more into nonfiction, and i think that if you are trying to get into essay collections, I think this would be probably be a good place to start. Like Samantha Irby in general. She also has a book, her first book called Meaty, that maybe I'll get one day, who knows. I never really know what to say when it comes to nonfiction works. So that's, that's my two cents on, wow, no thank you. There you go. When I read the next book by her that I have, I'll probably mark my favorite essays. I kept telling myself in my head that I was going to do it with that book, but I just fucking didn't and I forgot what my favorite ones are. Sorry. The next book that I read was Severance by Ling Ma. This book is about a girl named Candace. It goes between time uh, when there was no pandemic to when there was a like basically world ending pandemic. So this pandemic or virus or flu or whatever you wanna fucking call it 
goes around and it basically knocks out the entire population except for a few survivors, one of which was Candace. So Candace is in this group of survivors. There's a few other young people and then there's like, there's a leader. And Candace has a secret that she can't really tell anybody, otherwise they will ex immediately exploit it. And um, she doesn't want that, so she doesn't tell them. I gave this book a three star. This was the first book that I remember like hearing about, like that was about a pandemic while we were in a pandemic. And I was like, oh, that is interesting. And there are parts like before the pandemic actually like wipes out people. Um, when they're in New York or whatever and they are it shows time starting to become different to people. New York is all of a sudden becoming more and more empty and slower because people are just like dying off or getting sick um and it shows that part very very well. I really liked that. It kind of reminded me of when COVID started and like I remember being at the store that I worked at and it was so dead and I was like this is fucking eerie and it like was a lot of the same of that except for to m more of an extreme since it was like the entirety of New York City that we're looking at. I don't really remember this book that much. I don't think it had a lasting effect on me like I thought it would and I did not write down like any notes for it at all. There was a part that I liked where they were like in a mall and it obviously was like an abandoned mall and I really vibed with that heavy. I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. I just really liked that setting because mall settings already intrigued me. Abandoned malls already intrigued me. Put that shit together. Um, the next book that I read was Smashed by Junji Ito. I gave this one a four star, but here's the thing about my star ratings in Jinji Ito. I never know what to say because the only two books that I have read are Tomie and this one now. When I read Tomie, I was like, okay, I really like this. So I gave it a four, but then I saw other Jinji Ito books and I was like, oh, this one looks so much more intriguing than that one did, right? Okay, and then I read Smashed and I was like, this one's better than Tomie. And I don't know what to expect from like Shiver or any other things that he has. So I'm like, I don't know what to rate it in comparison to all the other books. Because if I'm, okay, I gave Tell Me I a four and then I gave Smashed a four. I don't think those two compete at all. I think Tell Me Yay is like, not, like knowing knowing that I'm facing them against each other, like this is obviously, like Tell Me Yay is obviously a two. And then like Smashed is a four or like a three or whatever the fuck. And maybe Shiver will be like a four or a five. And I can totally see the differentiation and why I think this one's a five between why I think Smashed is a four or a three. You see what I'm saying? So my rating for this right now is a four, but that is subject to change is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay. There is 13 stories in this book. My favorite story from this collection is Earthbound. I want to talk about it, but I, it would spoil the whole entire story because it's like a 20 page story. But I really, really like that one. And I think that was the most impactful to me, even though it wasn't really horror. I just liked the concept of it. I don't know how to explain it. I'm excited to read more of Jinji Ito's work. Hi, editing Kai here. Um, I forgot to talk about this book right here, Mob Psycho, volume three. Um, don't know why I forgot to talk about it, just didn't even mention it, but um, if you didn't know, Mob Psycho is a, a manga series about a kid who has like psychic powers. Like he can bend spoons, which is like an indicator that he's super powerful, and he can also like destroy people if he lets it get there, but he tries not to. This book specifically follows his younger brother who wishes that he too had powers. His name is Ritsu, by the way. So Ritsu wants the same powers that his brother has. And he one day gets confused with his brother by this guy who's like, we can help you expand your knowledge and make you more powerful. And Ritsu doesn't decline. He doesn't say, oh, I'm not my brother. He goes in and he wants to see what it's all about. He wishes that he had uh, psychic powers and abilities just like his brother does. So it's basically a story about that. I really want to read the fourth one because this left on such a cliffhanger that I was actually like, oh wait, I need to know. Because my boyfriend had only bought the first three 
and um i was just gonna read the first three and then like probably watch the anime series but literally the way that this ended made me want to read the fourth one so i mean i'm probably gonna do that that's this book and now that i've added it i am happy okay so the next six books i'm not going to talk about at all because i already talked about them in my last vlog where i read six horror books go check it out if you haven't seen it already but in that video i talk about ahem uh the deep by nick cutter the Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay, Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay, Horns by Joe Hill, Nosferatu by Joe Hill, and Little Heaven by Nick Cutter. Those are the six books that I talked about in that video. Go check it out if you have not, because I do not feel like talking about them again. All right, next. So the next book that I read was Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead by Emily Austin. I actually have no clue what her name is, but if that is right, I swear to God. Emily R. Austin, bitch. Okay, sorry. Sometimes I subconsciously, like, I, I remember things, like, in the back of my mind, and then I'll say it out loud, and I'll be like, is that even right? And it is. And, like, I'm like that with page numbers. Like, if you ask me a book that I have read and what how many pages it had, I will remember. My subconscious, she knows. Trust me, she knows. Anyways, I gave this book a five star because, holy fuck, did Emily R. Austin write about me? Hello. Basically, this follows a girl named Gilda who has pure O OCD, even though it never says that she does, but I kind of just took my own way with that. And I was like, okay, she has pure O, so do I. Whatever. In my professional opinion, she ruminates on death and like the people around her dying, the people that she loves, the people that she cares about, as well as strangers. She thought about this guy dying who was sitting her next to her on the bus and she has never seen this guy before and she never will again. Hi, what the fuck? That sounds like me. I have death ruminations too. I have pure OCD where I have I exactly that. So if you ever ever read Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead and if you have ever thought, I wonder what goes on in Kai knows how to read's brain, um, that's it. Hi, I'm not doing well. Anyways, so this book is about a girl who fears death so much and it honestly taxes a lot of her life. One day, while looking for a therapist, finally, or something to help her, she runs across this ad that she didn't know was an ad at that time, but she reads it and then goes to this church where she thinks like a therapy type thing is gonna happen, like a group moment. Um, but that doesn't happen. Instead, she gets a job being their receptionist. The reason being is because their receptionist, Grace, just recently died. Um, so isn't that interesting? Like somebody who already has these death ruminations uh, is now taking place of somebody who fucking died. Um, that's a really interesting, I really liked that a lot. I think that it is real, so realistic. The, the way that this author made Gilda think about death, it was so real. I was like, that's exactly how it goes. So basically it's just like one thought and then another thought and then another thought and it all connects and you know how thoughts work, you know what I mean? The author does a good job at showing how these intrusive thoughts can really creep up into your mind. Because like I said, I give the example of the old guy, like she was literally sitting next to this random guy and she was like, what if he has a heart attack and dies or like like anything could happen right here right now what if that happens and it's right next to me and i have to like save him or catch him or do cpr and i'm like oh, wow that's literally what goes on in my mind too hello it's like one second you're like not thinking about it at all like about death or about like whatever and then the next second it's flooding your mind and it's like how did we get here and i think that the author does a really good job at showing that gilda is also somewhat of a hypochondriac so am I. and she always is finding herself at the hospital and the hospital people know her fucking name and they're like okay whatever sit down we'll get to you and it's basically she has like panic attacks all the fucking time but she thinks she's having a heart attack and she always goes to the hospital for it or she thinks something's wrong so she goes to the hospital for it. I feel like this book was very cathartic for me because it truly was. It was interesting to see somebody who literally has your same mindset except for probably a little bit more disordered, let's be honest. But like, uh, has that mindset and it's like, oh, 
like I don't know it's just like there's something about reading about how your own brain works right um but yeah it's like I was saying like Gilda like has no attachment to this old man in the bus at all but yet she still has all of these elaborate thoughts of what it might be like when he dies. When I first heard about this book, I was like, okay, I immediately am going to need to read that. And I don't think it disappoints it. I gave it four stars, so, and I really like the cover. I say that for a lot of things, but I like the cover for a lot of things. The next book that I read was Pew by Catherine Lacey. This book is about a person who is found on a church pew one Sunday morning and nobody knows anything about this person. They don't know their name, they don't know their age, they don't know their gender. Everything about Pew is ambiguous. They know nothing about him and they don't really tell them about themselves. Uh, all the while there is this thing that's happening at the end of the week they're like wow you really had to come here during festival time really we have a week until the festival and the whole time pew and the reader is like what is this festival that they are talking about but throughout the book they're like we really don't care what your what any of this information is we don't care what your gender is we don't care what your age is we don't care what your name is they always say that they keep saying that but then they'll go on to say in like a few pages later or somebody else will say we really need to know this information about you like it doesn't change our opinion of you or anything like that but we really 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 need to get to the nitty gritty of this like we have to understand and it's interesting because I think that it's just supposed to be commentary about how people don't need to know your like sexual orientation or your race or anything obviously in the way that they did it with Pew that was inappropriate and I think it's still like stay stands like the way that they do it in like they people do it face to face it's like don't do that this book gave me the vibes of two movies that I watched. Um, one being Edward Scissorhands and two being like the 1973 like, version of The Wicker Man. Um, so the reason being is it reminded me of Edward Scissorhands because there's a family who let Pew come and join them or whatever the fuck. They were like, okay, you can like be in our family for the week or however long you need. They said like, however long you need, you can be here. And so he was, and I just thought it was interesting because like that was like, it's like a newcomer, right? Like how Edward was a newcomer and everybody was like whispering about him and he acted like he didn't know but he knew and pew knows that people are like talking about him what people are saying about um them like all of that and the family kind of has a little bit of a spotlight on them um so in that way it was kind of like edward scissorhands it reminded me of that like it reminded me of this one scene when <laughs> when the mom found edward and she was like driving in, uh, into her neighborhood and Edward was like looking out the window and everybody else was like and then like two minutes later when Edward's like at the house or whatever everybody comes knocking on the door and they're like oh like you got a special guest let's get to know him and all of that stuff I feel like it was the same way with that it was like the um 1973 uh wicker man because the entire town knew something that the main character did not know he was left and neither did the audience and it was the same thing when watching the wicker man we didn't know what was going on and neither did the main character but everybody else did and um so with this it was like the festival with the wicker man it was him being sacrificed the ending also was like amazing i don't want to really talk about it but it shows what the festival was <laughs> worth it worth those 120 pages it's such a short book that ending was so much up my alley i did not expect it's kind of like the same thing when i talked about lauren's in my last video where i just wasn't expecting like a certain thing to be a part of it and i'm like oh my god that's like my favorite type of thing to see in books even though i never say it out loud because it's so specific and i never say it out loud because it spoils all like like a lot of the books that i because I only I only bring it up when it actually does happen, but I'm realizing it happens a lot more than I thought it did. Because I mean, I have two books this month. The next book that I read was Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is the 
third Esavato book that I read. So I have read all three of her books that she has released. Um, I gave this one a three stars. I think I liked it the least out of all of her books. But it's about these two girls who have the same dad and this dad visits the one every summer but on his way to visit um, her he died in a car crash. This whole entire story talks about the individual experience between the two sisters. They don't know each other. They didn't know about each other until this happens. And so it just shows the two stories individually and then we have like a fourth of the book left maybe, maybe less than that, and they finally come together. I like what this book was about and what it was saying, talking about like forgiving people who you never even expected to forgive because you didn't even know who they were, you know what I mean? Like things like that, I think that that's a very important thing to talk about. Like that's something that you don't see in books often or in media often I feel like. And then trying, both of the sisters are trying to lead a new life now, knowing that they don't have their dad anymore and then knowing that they have, that they do have each other. I think um, that's interesting. We didn't really get to see much of their experiences play out together, like them being together. We didn't see a lot of that, which I wish we could have seen more of. Asavetto definitely has like a certain style of writing where it's like, if I read something, I feel like I'd be like, oh yeah, that's a... Uh, she has such a specific tone, I feel like it's like, oh yeah, that's obviously Elizabeth Acevedo right there. I wish that we could have seen more character development. I think that the dual conversation thing was a little bit hard, like the two point of views thing was a little hard to keep up with because I feel like we didn't really know the characters as much as we could have. Um, but I guess this was just supposed to be about the tragedy and them coming together from that. The next book that I read was On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. This book is a letter from a son to a mother who cannot read. It is heartbreaking and heartfelt and wow. It talks about being an immigrant from Vietnam. She worked at a nail salon um, and it spoke about that and how it's such a common job for immigrants immigrants to get and why it's such a common job for them to get and how their work li lives are less than adequate. I just thought that was really interesting because you never really fucking see that in- I've never seen or heard that conversation um, and I wish that I had before this moment. The writing style in this book is absolutely beautiful. It's poetic. He is a poet. So that probably is why it's it rings as if it's a long poem, but it really does and it's so good. Um, if you like flowery, beautiful writing, then I definitely check this out, but it is a tearjerker. It is very sad. As you can imagine, like the synopsis alone, all I said, it's a note to his mom, who by the way has been like, abusive and also had like mental health stuff like all of this stuff you know what i mean it's like i know that you were just trying to do your best mom but this is like how it ended up it's like one line that i thought was so beautiful that i wrote it down in my notes and it says hong a syllable the mouth must swallow a whole at once wow that is a beautiful fucking line are you kidding and it was just full of beautiful lines like that and i'm like i wish i could even start to write like that I definitely want to read more of this person's writing and uh, yeah, it's just it's a story about the raw love and forgiveness between a mother and a child. The next book that I read was Pizza Girl by I have no fucking clue. This book follows a girl who is unnamed just about the entire book and she is pregnant and she works at a pizza shop. One day the pizza shop gets a call and she answers it and on the other end is a woman who is asking for a very very specific type of pizza that they don't sell on the menu and that is a cheese pizza with pepperoni and pickles on it so this character this girl makes her pizza and delivers it to her personally this girl who is on the other end of the door her name and who was on the other end of the line her name is jenny and she has a son who will not eat anything except for 
pizza with pickles on it uh, and pepperoni, but it has to be made the right way. Otherwise, he'll just make himself starve. So they kind of come to this understanding. The, uh, she makes these pizza for this uh, woman and that's their thing. But then this character soon slowly starts becoming obsessed with Jenny and um, she really lets that take a lot of her life. The reason being is kind of um, in the air, which I enjoy. I think that it's supposed to be like, why did she become obsessed with Jenny? What's your two cents into why she became obsessed with Jenny? I have my two cents, whatever. We can have a conversation if you've read this book. I doubt it. I've never heard anybody talk. I've heard one person talk about this book. CJ Reads has talked about this book. I'm pretty sure one time somewhere in the past. I don't know. I think that might be accurate. For a lot of the book, I literally couldn't tell if it was a good or a bad book. Like, I've got to be honest. Um, I enjoyed parts of it, but then other parts I was like, okay. I was like, how realistic is it? Because everybody for some reason cares so, 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 so deeply about the main character. And I know it's the main character, like people are supposed to care. But I'm like, there's no way, like she was like a little down one time and then her like coworkers noticed. I'm like, there's no way my coworkers like, or like anybody would like notice that I'm like down, right? How realistic is that, right? I don't know, whatever. So that kind of like angered because there was like a lot of that, like people gave a fuck about this girl and she didn't give a fuck about any of them. And it was kind of like annoying. But I've got to be honest, at the end of the book, I kind of was relating to the girl in a way that I didn't really want to be relating. So basically her and her boyfriend had had like a fall out, like a feud or whatever and he was like i'm just trying to understand you girl and she was like fuck i've been a selfish little bitch and i'm like all right let's dial it back um it just it actually did make me realize some things in me that i didn't want to notice that i will now be working through you know what i mean i gave that book a three star i really like the cover the next book that i read is we are the brennans by i have no clue this book follows a family um, the one woman, her name is Sunday, and she left her family to go to California, and she was supposed to be there for a few weeks, but she just never came back. And everybody's like, why the fuck didn't she come back? Where the fuck is Sunday? Whatever. Um, while they're all living in New York, she, she's in California. And then she gets in a car crash, and her in case of emergency people need to be called and that happened to be her brother so they called her brother and he came and he's like come home and so she finally comes home after five years we eventually see why she didn't come home and why it stresses her out so much to be there it's kind of it was surprisingly heartfelt i wasn't expecting it to be like i thought it was just going to be messy messes just everywhere but it's a, it was a wholesome story she had a ex-husband named kale these names were so fucking weird kale sunday are you kidding okay <laughs> sounds about white but i've got to be honest kale and sunday's like love story the way that they got to get to know each other or like came to be was actually really fucking cute and i really liked it and it had me rooting for sunday instantly there like i expected it to just be a family drama and that was that i think i heard it like compared to shameless so i was like okay so everybody's just a mess and everybody's just an idiot i got that um but it wasn't that it wasn't that so i was honestly a little surprised by it and um i mean i gave it a three star an average read but there you go if this was exactly like shameless i don't know if i would have like hated it so fucking much or like secretly like been so obsessed with it i really can't tell the next and last book i read in october was follow me to ground have no clue it's by <laughs> have you noticed a theme in the last three books that i read jesus christ this book is about this girl and her dad and they have powers and they're human but not really this girl's name was ada but basically they can heal sick people and um they call them cures they call like everyday human beings cures they basically like bury the people in the ground and then like heal them through that so that's interesting but throughout this time, uh, Ada finds herself attracted to this guy named Samson and um, she lets her humanly desires get the best of her and tries to 
go on with him and she tries to create a relationship with him um something interesting though is Ada does not have any genitals so they're always like I don't know how this is even gonna work also just like but what about that early Samson was like that listen to this in an audiobook and there was parts in the middle of the book it was showing how one of their neighbors or somebody around them felt about the family. The narration was different people, which I really, really liked. And also I really liked the insight to how people were like perceiving this family. They were like, they're fucking weird. They're fucking, I don't know how I feel about this, all of that stuff. So I, I, I thought that was really cool. It's a really quick read. I like finished it in like two hours probably. I gave it a three star, I think. And is it bad that that's all of the information that I could say about it? So. 20 books later, and here we are. If you have read any of these books, I already said this in the beginning, but if you had read any of these books and you want to talk about them, you can message me on Goodreads. Uh, I've got nothing more to say.